Tiana, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I really appreciated our pre-call, like kind of brainstorming session where you mentioned you have all these, like what, what your vision, and I'm going to have you share your vision in just a second, but you nailed it on the head. I use so many different apps from, I'm not going to actually name them, but I use two different project managing apps. And I kid you not, here is my to-do list for today, a piece of paper with a lot of boxes and drawings on an art pad, because this makes my conversations in terms of how my brain works for tasks flow mm -hmm. very easily. And here you are trying to solve that big problem. But for our listeners out there, can you tell us you know, who you are, your background, and what you're working on? Yeah. My name is Tiana Linton. I own a personal branding marketing agency. We are based out of Hawaii, but we work with people all over the country. Tech. And I came up with this idea because I'm probably like the biggest pain in the butt when it comes to using the tools that like my team and I say we're going to use because I also am team pad of paper. Like the tools that we have tend to almost limit my pro productivity instead of increase it. So because that's counterintuitive to what I'm trying to do, I just won't use them. My team uses all of our softwares and tools and I just don't. I hand my pad of paper over to my assistant and be like, leave put that, th those notes in. But I think as I was building out what I wanted for our team, I realized that it didn't exist yet. So I needed to go and actually build something custom. And then after talking to all of my clients about the tools that they use and what I'm trying to create for us and because they're going to be switching over and things like that, they said that they also needed something like that. So it gave me a framework for how it could be used. Any industry, any level of profession, big team, small teams, individuals, it would work for anybody. The basis of it is that with AI, we can have tools that not only learn how we work, but they can actually take tasks off of our plate. So instead of building out a software where it's just to remind you to do tasks, it's going to actually do the tasks that are like the mundane time sucks that we all hate. And I think that the whole meaning behind it is there's almost been like this shift where people really hate work and they hate the stress of it and they feel like they can never get everything done that they, that they need to in a day. And I think that work for humanity is extremely meaningful when done correctly. I think that as people, like we need work and a sense of accomplishment. And I think what's happened isn't that people don't want to work. It's that they don't want to work the way that we've been working. Building out this tool I have a vision where it's going to feel like an assistant, like a real life in-person assistant, and you can talk to it. It's going to be voice prompts, text prompts, things like that, so that you can ask it to do things that you need. Hey, put this in my calendar. Hey, can you pull up that call that I had the other day with so and so? Can you make sure that this person's coming to the meeting? There's so many different things that are super small that have to get done, but they take up minutes here and minutes there. And it adds up to feeling like we really didn't accomplish anything in the day. So the solution is really just, it's an AI based tool. But imagine if you took like ChatGPT, Salesforce, HubSpot, ClickUp, Slack, all of those things, but then add like a video component, mm -hmm. how you can send video messages to people on your phone, where you can screen record and things like that for internal communications. Mm -hmm. And all of those things had a baby and it built on top of it. <laughs> A pretty good uh that's a, an incredible vision to to zoom out maybe like a thousand years zoom out what you just mentioned was pretty interesting that and i agree with you i think that we need work more than the work needs us in terms of humans and, and less i'm not i'm not talking just like on the psychological aspect i think that work is superiorly meaningful and it is disheartening to hear people hating or dreading going to work uh because that's not how it should be uh and i think that's the, the misanalysis but i like your reframe that we don't hate work, we just really dis dislike the mundane things that a machine should be doing for us. I'd like for, for can I walk us through your evolution here? Because I've had, so I had Zeb from ClickUp on the podcast, and he was in the marketing, he had his marketing agency, and then ClickUp was born. I had another dude, I think he's in Switzerland, I forgot, I'll have to figure out where his location is, but they created a SaaS from their marketing agency. So I see this evolution happening as you're solving an important problem within the work that you already are doing. So that's a testament to the value of work. You did the work, you found a roadblock, you're solving a new problem based on that foundation you built. But help us walk through that evolution. Like the issue is 
what you, your team experience. But how did you take that idea, which a lot of people here might be listening and have an idea, they're in their business, they're in their job, they might be starting something on the side, they might be in corporate America. How did you go from cons- like an idea to now actually implementing? And I know you're like in your funding race, but walk us through that. I think I have always been someone where if there is a problem that annoys me enough, I will just do it myself in order to fix it. Over the years, it's been like bashing my head against a wall, trying to get a tool that can do what we need and be as seamless as we need it to be and not feel like it's dragging the whole team down. Um, right now, we use Moxo, which I enjoy for a lot of different aspects, but it's, it only does one piece of the puzzle. And I'm also, so I have ADHD, so I think that I want simple tools. I want tools that are fast. I want tools that are intuitive. I don't want to have to spend a ton of time learning a new platform, learning a new software, because it shouldn't, like Apple, everybody knows, like a kid can pick up an iPhone and figure out how to use it. It needs to feel like that. And business tech has not done that. None of the business softwares have that sort of user experience built into it in the same way that like a consumer product would. So... I really just started because I was building it for us. I didn't think that it was going to be something everybody would want. I just knew that I was annoyed and I needed to fix the problem. When I built out the idea, I talked to my clients about it because I was like explaining my annoyance with our current software. I'm actually very close with all of our clients, so it's easy to just ask about things. And all of them were like, I want that. And so then I was like, oh, okay. And it opened up the idea of, maybe more people want this. So then I reached out to everybody in my network and I was like, so how would you like feel about a tool that functioned like this? And every single person not only said that they wanted it, but that they felt like it would completely change the way in which they work and make their work more meaningful. Hmm. And that's what gave me pause is the more meaningful aspect. And I guess from, I I talked to 30 or 40 people, the general consensus is that The small tasks that take up a lot of time because they add up actually detract from the ability to do the work that you love. And Mm -hmm. so then that led me to the concept of that's actually the problem with work is if you look on like the Reddit forums and things like that, you'll see that most people feel like the tools that are supposed to be making them more productive are making them less productive. And then, and this is me going on a tangent, but If you think about the way that we have used like ChatGBT, we've almost taken the things that humans find enjoyable, writing, art, creative thinking, and given it to tech, as opposed to keeping tech the tool and giving the more interesting human-centric parts of the work that we do back to humans. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's a huge perversion there. Like tech should make our life easier. And I had this thesis and... I think it was 20. I'm not here to say like I foresaw or anything, but like in 2010, that I think the future, since everything's going to be so tech, humans are going to be more humans, more feet on the grass, more hu- things that, that, that technology can't do. And I think you're right. The incredible, I don't want to use a terrible word here, but just phenomena of people depending on tech for creativity versus actually being creative or being bored and figuring things out on your own versus leveraging tech to accelerate things that are mundane. And that's actually like the thesis of outsourcing or leveraging different tools in AI. That's the one thing that I try to figure out is how do I, if I subscribe to this tool and it's 200 bucks a month, but it's going to do very mundane things for me and I don't have to do those things and it automates it. Like, absolutely, that's incredible for me. So you're trying to do that and piece it in, in, in one location, which I think is pretty fascinating. So you talk to about 40 to 60 people, 40, 50 people, you got market validation. And this kind of goes back to the bigger mission of making work meaningful again. How did you take that? You got market feedback, you got the idea, you got, you just, how do you take that to market into where you're at right now? Hold on, I'm gonna shut my window because my neighbor is now doing his yard. Okay. It's literally like never ending. Like one person does it one day, one person does it. Okay, so your question was, how do I bring it to market? Getting it to market hasn't been easy because it requires almost a completely different way of thinking. So basically it was like, I want to throw away everything that we have. And imagine if we didn't have tech and I was building what I wanted, what would it do? And then from there, I was like, okay, we need to figure out the validation of 
the tech behind how we would make this work. So then I talked to someone on my board who specializes in AI and things like that. And she said the AI aspect is definitely doable. And so it was really just, like I said, I went completely like basics. Nothing exists yet. What would you want it to do? So we got rid of the dashboard. So there, it has no dashboard. It's prompt based, like completely prompt based. It will generate whatever it is that you ask for in the software. And it's machine learning. So it's going to learn and adapt how you work and all of these things. And so there's so many different pieces of it that it requires having a lot of specialists in order to be able to figure out how do we make each piece of this function on the back end to keep the user experience as simple as possible. Because I want to take this extremely complex software and have it feel like the most simple, like breathing as a tool. And so... Getting it to market once it's built, I don't think will be difficult at all because I'm a marketer, but also because the need is there. You can ask anybody how they feel about the project management tool or CRM and they're going to have a complaint. And I think the issue is that it just, it hasn't evolved. Think about all of the tools that we have and then think back to seven, eight years ago. They're the same. They haven't really done anything new. And so I think a lot of it too is We keep iterating off of what we already have, as opposed to asking ourselves with the new technology that we have access to that is available now, how can we create something that's completely new and different that solves the problem in a more robust? When you innovate, you're definitely challenging common beliefs and different ideas. One of those beliefs is that tools are usually niche or job specific. And what you're building out is multifaceted, meaning there's like probably five or six different jobs that it does. How, how are you going to maintain the integrity of the use case there? And how complex is that to actually build or when you're talking to investors to get funding to back that kind of idea? So I think the hurdle has been explaining how it would adapt because that's something that people find not only mind-blowing, but really it's like sci-fi. I had one person who was like, it's like a sci-fi movie. And I was like, have you looked around? That's where we're going <laughs> as a society that's where we're headed. And I think the the actual biggest hurdle has been data privacy. Most people are highly concerned because in order for the software to be adaptive in the way that I want it to, it has to be able to track a lot. So we're building out our data privacy in a way where there's a tool that you can use that will actually be able to determine whether or not the information shared is proprietary. So that determines what goes into our model and what doesn't. And we're building it off of algorithms that are already in use because no one wants to go build out their own, their own AI algorithm. Mm -hmm. But I think getting investors to understand the, because when you think about a pitch deck, most pitch decks are like, we're solving this one problem, right? In order to solve the problem of productivity and like a disenchanted workforce, you have to solve a lot of underlying issues. So for me, because I have almost the full breadth of the vision, it's extremely difficult sometimes to figure out what's the part that they're going to care about the most. So we've actually been leveraging video in order to show how the software would work. Because I found that you can talk about it all day, but until they can see like what it's going to look like. yeah. And so we don't have our MVP yet, but I've built out demos of use of exactly how it would function using because like we can design fake versions of that all day so that they can get an idea of what it would feel like. And I've gotten a lot of really good feedback on that. So I think it's just about thinking outside of the box, which marketers are inherently like very good at, and then thinking about the psychology of like how people interpret data and putting those things together to be like, okay, I know you're used to seeing pitch decks that give you like pictures of what the software is going to look like. Here is not a live demo, but an example of what it's going to function like so that you can have a really strong frame of reference for the, the generative aspect, because that's the piece that people seem to also get stuck on is what do you mean it's going to generate and you don't have a dashboard? I'm like, blank dashboard, it's, it's hard to chat see, bar, yeah. you ask it for what you want and it brings it up. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. And obviously it'll adapt depending on the person that like maybe they need mm-hmm. a prompt or something, they're prepared like a button to, to click every day yeah. so they know what to focus on that day, what to execute. Yeah, and I stuff. think... Imagine if you had an executive assistant who came in every morning and covered your day with you and had that conversation with you of what needs to get done and things like that. That's an aspect of it that's built in that can be used is it's meant to almost feel like you have 
someone called it a chief of staff that's working with you. So yeah. it can say, well, this person canceled the meeting. Do you want to move that other meeting to this time based on it learns how you work and what you normally do when certain events happen so that next time those come up, it can anticipate your needs and then prompt you, hey, is this what you want to do? So it's very forward thinking. It's very intuitive. And it's, in my opinion, like how tech should be used. Tech should be used to assist us and make us more effective and better at what we do as opposed to trying to get tech to just completely replace humans. I think that's yeah. a big conversation that's concerning for a lot of people. And I think, honestly, if we continue down the road that we have been, that's what would happen. So mm -hmm. the other big piece of what we're trying to do is give a framework of what does it look like when we augment human work with tech as opposed to replacing human work with tech? Yeah, that's a bigger argument there. To shift gears here and get some of your, like, your mindset, the way that you approach this, you're a non-technical founder and you're living the prophecy that non-technical founders will do incredible work that usually a tech of team of 10 could do. So that's kudos for you for doing that and taking the stab there and leaning into tech that way. Tell me more about some of the things that have either surprised you or some of the risks. Hey, I didn't see this risk coming in terms of like the things to think about because you took an idea doing marketing and branding for your clients and you took an idea to build tech and you're actually executing on top of that and you're not a technical founder, but you're still making strides and moving forward towards that. What are some of the beliefs that you have around the work as well as some of the things that may have surprised you in that journey? I think when I first had the idea, I imagined that I would have to hire someone to do the tech for me, which I, that's still obviously going to have to happen, but it was this giant hurdle in my head of you don't have a technical background. And so everyone on the internet and everyone you meet tells you that it's not possible for you because you're not a techie. But I'm someone where I dropped out of college because I felt like it wasn't the best way to learn. I was like, this is not fast enough and it's not specific enough to what I'm trying to do in life. Learn how to build a business, all of that. I found that mentorship has helped a lot way in that aspect is sometimes it's much better to learn from people who actually have the experience than to sit in a classroom and just be lectured at. But I think because I already had those experiences of going against the curve of what's expected, I was like, what's one more thing? Okay, you told me that I was going to need like a master's degree in order to be able to start a successful company. No, I didn't. I just learned it online. Like we have an, such a huge amount of resources available to us, whether it's through our network or through any sort of like data online that we have, that if you know how to research properly, it, it's very simple to learn the things you need to. And also, I took a stab at it and started learning coding and it came very naturally. And it wasn't because I wanted to build it out myself. It was, I don't like sitting in a room with a bunch of people who are talking about a problem that I don't have any framework having conversations about what would be the hurdles for the tech really bothered me because I couldn't grasp what they were communicating. So I took the time to go and learn those things in order to be able to have in intelligent, like problem solving conversations with the people that are helping me. So you have to learn the language. The language is very different. Yeah. Like I remember the first time I heard someone say that the AI was hallucinating and I was like, that's crazy. <laughs> But I think if they, it all comes down to just curiosity. I, I think if you're curious enough and willing to take the time to sift through the information, like you can pretty much solve 99% of problems yourself and then figure out now that you have the solution, like who do you need to bring it to life? I think people underestimate the ability, like if you have a really good problem that people hate and you have a really strong solution to it, You'll find a lot of people are extremely excited about it and willing to get involved. And I think it, it's just, you never have to do something alone. And that's where a lot of people get stuck is they're, it's, I'm in a silo. It's my idea. I can't tell people about it. They'll steal my idea. And it's a lot of people might try to steal your idea, but it's not going to look the same and feel the same as when you build it. So it's having the self-confidence there, but also being willing to go talk to about it and not be afraid of like the consequences of someone trying to take it from you. Yeah. You're showing right now that 
the idea is one thing, the actual legwork, and no one's going to do all that work just for you, just because we hear, like, the whole Zuck thing and, like, the whole legal, like, back in the Facebook days, like, that's not really going to happen here. Like, everyone has an idea, and they're not going to steal it from you. It's a lot of work to bring it from idea to actual life. Um, mm -hmm. And that was pretty interesting because you mentioned earlier around having a board. Is that that you learned through mentorship? Or how did you know who to assemble? Because you dropped a few key nuggets there around the beliefs that you have that 99% of the problems are solvable, that it talks to a lot of people, and that people want to help. So you leverage the natural abilities that you have of moving quickly as well as getting other people involved, which are beliefs that you have. So I think this is important for us to rewind that section and re-listen to that again. But maybe shifting gears even more here, but you talked about having a board. You had you talked about having key partners. Was that just something that came up through mentorship or was that something that you knew that you had to prepare so you prepared for? What, were, what was some of the thinking around that? I have been really lucky that through my network, I've met a lot of people who are in the tech space. And... When I was thinking about whether or not to get a CCO before the raise, because that was actually a really big pausing point for me, was determining whether or not it was feasible to go through a raise without a CTO. The feedback that I got is it was not. But then there were a few outliers who said, with the right board, it will show that you have the technical expertise there. They're just not the CTO. So mm -hmm. it gives you the validation that you need for the tech. It shows that you have access to experts and it also validates the idea through the fact that they're willing to give their time because the board is also free. Like it's not paid for right now. Like they are people who just think the idea needs to exist. And so they're doing this of their own oh, yeah. like free time that they have outside of their yeah, rather job. robust jobs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so when I was building the board, it was me just reaching out to people I'm a big fan of LinkedIn. I think more people should leverage LinkedIn. They're not doing enough there. <laughs> Everyone across the board could do better. But just reaching out to people with, hey, I see that you're doing this. I have I'm working on a project and I have some questions. I'd love to pick your brain. A lot of people are really open to that, especially if you come from a place of being excited about their expertise and actually listening to what they have to say. So that was how I found one of my board members. Her name is Summer. She has like a PhD in artificial intelligence and like voice and all of these different aspects that are still very out there for me to conceptualize. But she's been extremely helpful in helping me understand the actual things that are going to be hurdles. So things like data privacy, cybersecurity, all of those aspects are things that I knew of but hadn't really had the full picture. So having the right mentors on your board, just I think because I'm used to having mentors throughout my life, it comes naturally to assume that you're going to need people. So when I was learning about the kind of startup space and that there were boards, I was like, perfect. That's what I need. I think the biggest hurdle I've had around building the board has been finding people who have the extremely specific pieces. It's taken longer than I would have wanted finding someone who had the level of skill and knowledge around machine learning and artificial intelligence that she has, it took time. And so I do move quickly, but I think that in the space of startups, people sometimes worry that if they're not going the fastest, they're going to fail because someone else is going to get there first. And I would argue that it's more important to move quickly, but with intention mm -hmm. than to just run at something like full send without having any framework of these things need to happen in order. And I'd rather find the right people and do it right the first time than have to just keep chasing my tail. Yeah. Speed without direction is uh, you might not mm -hmm. go anywhere, but speed, lowering the speed to go further is increasing your velocity. So that makes a lot of sense. And taking pauses, like people don't pause enough to say, am I going in the right direction? This was the goal. This is what I'm working on. Does that still make sense? Because a lot of times I think we will veer off without realizing it. So if you don't pause and assess where you're at and what the goal is, oftentimes you'll find yourself like in the completely wrong direction and then you have to backtrack. Back to the ethos of this podcast of being human. Just focus on being human. Yep. Oh, I love that. Well, Tiana, for our listeners out there, where's the best place for people to want? Thank you for being on and to learn more about what you're up to and when the, when the app goes live. Yeah, so you can find more about the waitlist on Elias.ai. That's A-L-L-I-U-S.ai. 
And then you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Just Tiana Linton is a great place to reach me if you want to actually connect. I am on Instagram, but I won't lie to you. I try to avoid going on that as much as possible. So we post, but I'm, I try not to put too much time into it. <laughs> LinkedIn's way better. Yeah, I hear you. Awesome. I'll put those links in the show notes. Thank you again for being on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the podcast. If you'd like to get more of these podcasts, please go ahead and subscribe to wherever you're watching or listening to the pod. If you have any suggestions or questions that you want me to answer on the pod, or you have a guest that you want me to interview, please go ahead and email me all of your suggestions and questions at podcast at dogoodwork.io. That's podcast at dogoodwork.io. If you'd like to give me public feedback, you can go on Apple Podcasts, and from there, you can leave up to a five-star review. I would greatly appreciate that. If you like more free resources where you can get my best strategies to help you increase your company's performance and scale profitably, where you can get handpicked articles to propel your growth, and you can get trainings and discussions that I give freely online, as well as low-cost resources such as my books and guides, you can get all of that by going to dogoodwork.io forward slash free dash growth dash resources. 90% of all of these resources are not behind any email opt-in, so you can get instant access by going to dogoodwork.io forward slash free dash growth dash resources. Now, if you'd like to accelerate your progress and shorten the gap between information and action and start seeing results in your business, let's work together to increase your company's performance and scale profitably and serve more clients without the overwhelm. You can request a free clarity call to see how we can best support you to reach your goals by going to dogoodwork.io forward slash apply. Again, that's dogoodwork.io forward slash apply. As always, it's an honor to be a small part in your journey. This is Raul Hernandez. Do good work.